So Galen, Final Fantasy VII just came out. Yeah, yeah, it just came out. Uh, have you have you played it yet? No, that's... N- no, you don't, Oprah. <laughs> How do you think Cloud holds his sword up? Um, with a lot of upper body strength? I imagine there's, like, a lot of strength training that's involved, which is very weird because he has very tiny arms. The, th- the thing is, though, is that he, he lifts it and he puts it even behind his back. So, like, you think he has back problems? Possibly. I mean, I, I would imagine that it's a lot of, like, l- lifting with the lower back, which really is not good for you. You should not lift that way. But I have a feeling that Cloud is kind of the, eh, I'll do what I want kind of person. I, I think, actually, that's what you want to do. Like, okay, I'm not a weightlifter or anything, but I think you want to put all of the weight in your lower back, uh, jerk your knees upward, and hyperextend your ankles. <laughs> yeah, that is the perfect way. That's how you're supposed to lift things. Right, right. <laughs> You bring up an interesting point, though. Who do you think has more back problems, Cloud or Tifa? Hmm. I would probably say Cloud, because I don't think he takes care of himself. Like, Tifa, yeah. you know, Tifa has to live with that sort of burden. Plus, I mean, Cloud's boobs are just bigger. That's true. Yeah. The materia on that guy. <laughs> oh, a reference to the unofficial PlayStation magazine from 30 years ago? Oh my is god, that did they is? make that joke? <laughs> yes, yes, you were subscribed to it. Ah, uh, I was. I, I remember because you were like, what does this mean? What's Matria? And I was like, oh. <laughs> and you've been annoying me ever since. Yeah. Hello, my embezzling cryptocurrency miners. You do you, boo. Friends, thank you for joining us today on the Nintendo Everything Podcast, episode 75. Mm-hmm. My name is Oni Dino, and with me, I have a man with a virtual bank account. It is so impenetrable that not even the crypto mama herself could crack that nut. It's Galen. Yeah, sadly, that balance is at a zero. So, you know, do all the work, get in there, and you don't really get much of anything out of it. Galen. (laughs) This is a family-oriented podcast. You can't talk about your sex life on here. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Friends, PSA. Uh, Nintendo does not recommend you use alcohol to clean your Joy-Con. Was that a thing? Oh my god, do you not read the news? Galen, we have a website. I mean, I've been spilling vodka on my, you know, Joy-Cons for, you know, months now, so... You're telling me I shouldn't do that. Uh, So many questions. So many. (laughs) Listen, I've discovered how to make Moscow Mules, and they have been my go-to this past couple of weeks. (laughs) Oh, good. Moscow Mules are lovely. Moscow Mules, not Mules, are -hmm. lovely. Yeah. Do you have the copper mug? I do, actually. Good. It, it is required, actually. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Actually, actually. I, I didn't the first couple of times I made it, but it definitely makes much of a difference. Yes. Mm-hmm. You can say I'm plus one in alcohol now. You know, just like, you say a lot of things, and sometimes you I'm, say certain things that I'm just like, I want him off of this podcast, I'm and just, that's one of them. I'm just trying to bring it around to the whole gaming thing theme. I hate you. <laughs> what is coming up in this episode? We are talking about, of course, the cooking mama herself. There's a lot of cooking mama drama, if you will. Drama from another mama? Yeah. <laughs> and also, we are talking about uh, China banning imports of Animal Crossing New Horizons and related physical media. We'll get into what's going on there. Oh, yeah. But we have so many video games to talk about. We have been playing so many video games, and it's time for me to just take a dump all over them. I mean, not really. There's a lot of stuff I like. Take that uh, crypto dump. Uh Uh-huh. Better than mama. (laughs) What what is that? I've seen people uh, typing that. What's better than mama? What is that? It's just something that she says. Like, if when you're playing the Cooking Mama games, if you get, like, uh... S rank on the master or on the oh. recipe. She goes, Oh, 
Betta's and Mama. I was just going to say, does she say it with a Japanese accent? Oh, hell yes, she does. <laughs> Sugoi. <laughs> Although, at least she did back when it was like coming out for the Wii and stuff. I haven't played any of the games since the Wii and the DS. Well, you can't play this one. Yeah. And we'll get into why later. Right now, let's move on into our Adobencha Dogu. Galen, sometimes you take virtual adventures, especially right now during this uh, macaroni virus. Yes. Where do you tweet? Uh, I tweet about all of my macaroni and other pasta-related things uh, on Twitter. You can find that at Mobius087. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can do that as well on Instagram. <laughs> at... <laughs> <laughs> Allow myself to introduce myself. I don't, I don't know. Uh, introducing the the Instagram handle is always weird because I want to be like it's at true underscore Mobius, but there's That's no fine. at. So, is that what it is? Yeah, it's it's true underscore Mobius. That is Kay. the Instagram handle. <laughs> and w- where can you be found sneezing online? <laughs> well, now I have to keep the sneezing. I know. <laughs> It's like that was intentional. <laughs> Sometimes I sneeze words into Twitter at Oni underscore Dino. And sometimes I cook macaroni and other foods on my Instagram, Oni underscore underscore Dino. That that seems to be where the separation is. I will admit, your your retweeting game has been very strong lately. I've been My following... retweet Yeah, <laughs> is real good. Real yeah. strong. You've had some pretty good original stuff on there too. Uh, don't think so. <laughs> oh, the thing about my cat, though, this week was pretty, uh, that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I like the, uh, the back and forth we were having about, um, con man Randy Pitchford. I <laughs> hardly remember it because I was filled with rage. Just f- flames. Flames on the side of my face. Heaving, he- heaving <laughs> breath. That pile of gonorrhea of a man definitely has that effect on people. <laughs> That, that is what that man is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking of that, except not really, Galen, you <laughs> have been playing Animal Crossing. How's it coming along? It's it's good. It's, it's going pretty well. You know, my island's coming along quite nicely. I feel like I need a little bit of a different change of pace. You know, there's the, you know, the high tension of building up the... Uh, the island and you know all the pressures of those bills coming in I just I need an escape I need some sort of a an avenue out a last escape some may say Uh uh-huh it's Uh true that once the wheels of justice begin to turn exactly it also help doesn't help that I've been setting up so much trash about my island that it is a huge biohazard oh okay okay brought it around good job (laughs) But wait, actually, I do have a real question for you on Animal Crossing. Oh, okay. Uh, who's your favorite <laughs> villager? I wanted to ask you this last week. Oh, shit. Um, hmm. Uh, uh, the ones that I have right now, I think my personal favorite is Puddles. She's a little frog. Okay, tell me about her. She's, <laughs> uh, she has dreams and aspirations of being a social media icon. Um, Ugh. and she, her character is just so extra. It, it's like, I recognize how extra it is. And I appreciate the, the commentary of it all. Is it like a self-referential humor kind of thing? Like she's in on the joke or what's, what's going on there with her? Well, it, it's more like every time you go up to her and she's like, oh, hey, you know, take a selfie with me. Or, oh, hey, here's my, um, my recipe. It's going to be worth a lot when I get, you know, big and famous and get this island trending. You know, little stuff like that. Things that it's, it sounds a little cringy because it's written to kind of be that way. But if you're mm. in on the joke and you understand what they're doing... And you can look past it as of, oh, who is this basic bitch? Mm. You, you can appreciate the humor in it. And that's why I like her character. Well, she sounds awful. Mm-hmm. She is. And that's part of what's great about it. <laughs> See, you you seem to have an affinity for having awful people as your friends. Um, What's going on there? Sounds like a character flaw. I've had years and years of experience, you know. Moving on. <laughs> Before we get into your last escape, let's talk just a bit, because I got two games I want to talk about. 
You only have one, so therefore I'm twice as good as you. I want to talk a little bit about Hob Definitive Edition on Nintendo Switch. This has been on your backlog for a while, right? Bro, everything is on my backlog. I've seen your Switch, that's true. <laughs> now, this game is a isometric, top-down puzzle adventure game. Somewhat similar to Zelda. There's little, little bits of uh, threads in there. Mm -hmm. Have you happened to see this game before? Is that a sentence? Yes, it is a sentence, and I understood what you were saying. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I have seen this before, and it looks like the kind of puzzle game that I would definitely be interested in. Yeah, it is. Um, it's got a very striking visual aesthetic to it. I mean, I don't know. Like, it does look like a few other games, but the art direction is very strong in it. So mm -hmm. you play as this like little kind of mysterious guy in like red robes. And he reminds me a little bit of like a mixture between a Twilight from uh, Twilight Princess and like the main character from Journey. Mm -hmm. There's so the story is very bare bones because it's uh, kind of textless. There's some sort of like insidious alien dark matter thingy that is poisoning and ruining the land and you're trying to fight it. And that's it. You go. You you do platforming and puzzle solve, uh, explore, get power ups. So that would kind you of thing. would you say it's more like Legend of Zelda s explorative with puzzles, or would you say that it's more Metrovania esque? Mm, I would say it's so. You know how like there's a little bit of overlap between like a Metroidvania and a Zelda game because yeah. they both have the thing of like find a new item then you can go and do the thing it's it's got those elements to it i would say definitely it's more like a zelda than it is anything else okay i'm kind of half and half on it right now i've been playing it for several hours i should have checked how long but there are some really good strengths with this game the art direction like i started to mention is just so great it's very much like a fantastical nature mixed with ancient ruins kind of look to it Lots yeah. of strong, bold colors, um, kind of a lot of flat colors as well. Not not super flat, but uh, there's not a whole lot of dimension to the colors compared to you know some other realistic looking things. Mm -hmm. There's tons and tons of intricate animations throughout the game. Not only your main character doing stuff, but also uh, doors opening, chests unlocking, uh, enemy actions, the animals that live in the alien world that you're in them interacting with the environment it's super super detailed and this like the aesthetic of this game is so strong it's kind of like if if you're into like gears and old ruins and like unlocking something and then it like changes the entire environment of the game or something like that this is like your pornography because it's really done well. <laughs> uh, with the mention of like the gears and whatnot, would you say that it has something of a steampunk aesthetic to it? Or no, is it I would more not. mild than that? I wouldn't. I don't really Good. care for steampunk aesthetic very much. I'm not a fan either, but people hear gears and they start to think of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. But I mean, it's not just like your character is not wearing a, a top hat, a brown top hat, and he's got an eye patch and he's got like a, a a thing of metal on his arm that shoots an arrow or something like that. This is not what's happening in this game. Mm. <laughs> it's very mm. much ancient ruins and fantastical nature. Excellent. Yeah. I, I also like how there is not any dialogue in this game. Any text is kind of like relegated to the menus and such. And even that is kept to a minimum. And I really love a game that executes the show don't tell contravance effectively. Hmm. And also the opening five minutes of this game is really great and you feel really impassioned to play and figure out the mystery. Not going to spoil anything. But it's not even like a spoiler, it's just it's a strong opening and I want people to go in really fresh in case you're interested in this game. Okay. Hi ever. And you know there's always a hi ever with me. There always is. <laughs> I do have some some kind of strong dislikes, but they're all kind of the same one. 
I was enamored with the art style and the mystery that it felt like the game was kind of baking, but it's all just kind of gone stale after playing the game for several hours now. Um, and that's just my general feeling with this game, is that everything's great. The puzzles are fun, the restrained action, because there's fighting in it, but very little. It's much more like puzzle heavy and like exploring and stuff. That's all great, but it's just that it's after several hours, like none of it's progressing and I'm mm -hmm. feeling like I, I'm not being driven to go forward with it. So it feels like from a storytelling aspect, it feels like stagnant. Honestly, from like every aspect. So like storytelling, puzzle wise, visuals, action just everything just kind of feels like i've been doing kind of the same thing for a couple of hours now and i i i don't care anymore i don't want, I've, I've seen what this <laughs> game is doing it seems like there's a lot more of it doing the exact same and i'm kind of done with it unfortunately i really would love to play this game to the end but i i don't feel like i want to play it anymore just because it's kind of been the same thing over and over i think one of the big things for me is that so there's like some backtracking, right? Like there's collectibles, there's power-ups, stuff like mm -hmm. that. The environmental design does not change enough for me between areas. Like I, I never remember where the hell something was because everything looks like a green nature area or a dry nature area or a little mechanical area. And that's the whole world so far from the several hours I've been playing. There's no like big changes that make me think, oh, this is definitely like the area with a lot of cliffs, or this is the area with snow, or this is the area that is wide open versus really narrow or something like that. It's just like every part of the game looks and feels kind of samey. So the, the environment just doesn't have that personality for you? No, it, it totally has personality, but it doesn't have personality between itself. It's like having sex tuplets and they're all beautiful looking <laughs> like <laughs> great but i mean i can't tell you apart mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know it wouldn't be a problem if the game were linear but it's kind of free like a typical zelda game is so you're gonna be going back and forth and it just kind of i don't know it would be a little bit of a problem if it were linear but it would be a little bit less of a problem yeah so anyway i I, I definitely feel like I got my money's worth out of it. I don't remember how much I bought it for, so whatever. But it definitely got it on sale. Uh, yeah. I think it normally goes for like 20 USD, but I definitely got it on sale maybe closer to 12 or something like that. I had a great time with it, but just, I don't know, it doesn't evolve. The game doesn't evolve. Yeah. That's, hmm. I've actually, this is one of those games that's actually on my eShop wish list that I've kind of been keeping an eye on, waiting for it to go on sale, and then seeing it go on sale, I'm like, eh, okay, maybe I'll wait for the next sale. Mm -mm. Around. So, Have you played the demo? Because there is a demo on the eShop. Oh, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't download that and yet. play it. Um, it. It's a great demo because honestly, that's what sold me on getting the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, just to make sure that you feel, you feel like you like the movement in the game, the fighting, the puzzle solving, that kind of thing. Because honestly, all that stuff feels really good. It's just that they they should have changed it up after like where I'm at in the game. Yeah. I don't know. If anybody else has played that out there and you know they feel like, oh no, you should totally stick with it for this or that reason or whatever, then you know please do write into us and uh, I don't know, encourage me to go through it if there really is something more at the other end of the tunnel. Absolutely. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm encouraging the listeners. <laughs> okay. Encourage listeners, don't encourage Galen, by writing into us at Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. Send that directed criti er, criticism, encouragement to mm, for things. Criticism. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Uh, side note, there are a lot of really good games on sale in the shop right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. In, yeah. in the eShop and at various retailers throughout the world, I'm hearing as well. So mm -hmm. uh, keep an eye out for those games you're looking at. Absolutely. And speaking of looking at, Galen, the worst video game in the world came out recently, according to people. And it's because Jill Valentine was censored. What? <laughs> Her boobies are not everywhere, so oh. therefore she is censored. And also, 
in her original costume with the boob tube. Her skirt is now a skort. Therefore, you cannot see any panty shots. <laughs> a travesty among gamers, really. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, Damn that Capcom. <laughs> and by the way, I have to say for the record... Sometimes people don't get when I'm doing sarcasm on the podcast. I'm a very sarcastic person in general. I am sarcastic about this right now. I don't give a damn that she has a squirt on, like, whatever. But there are some people on the internet that have such a strong opinion. And, uh... Gross. (laughs) Galen, tell me about Resident Evil Remake 3. Well, you know, there have been a lot more changes to this game than, you know, Jill's... You know, sandwich. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, they have not made that uh, joke yet once. <laughs> uh, hopefully, at the very end, they will. Cross my fingers. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I have been playing the Resident Evil Three Remake lately, and game is fun. I don't know if I'm having the same reaction to it that I was with Resident Evil Two. But this is a very different beast of a game compared to Resident Evil 2. So um, I feel like a lot of people, when they announced this, especially those who were not too familiar with it, they knew of the franchise, they knew of what it was like, but they, what is it I want to say? Uh, they didn't know the finer details. Like they, they've heard of the games, but they haven't played the games. I feel like those people would have worried that, oh, well, this is a sequel to the game they came out with last year much different story in in what regard do you mean like it's it's a different story like genuinely the story or do you mean gameplay atmosphere what's going on here uh a little bit yes to everything so starting with the story this is much more action oriented which is kind of in spirit to what the original uh nemesis was compared to the original resident evil 2 like when they developed that they were doing that um Quite a few times that I've been playing this game, I had the thought cross my mind that this is what they wanted to do with Resident Evil 6. Okay. So with Resident Evil 6, the story was very guided. It wasn't so much focused on the exploratory aspect. It was more of, here is the setting, here are these things that you can interact with us in the setting, and we're going to move you from stage to stage. So many set pieces. That's kind of what I'm getting a sense of here. There is a little bit of backtracking and whatnot, but it doesn't prompt nearly as much backtracking and exploration as what I remember from the original Resident Evil. Uh, Nemesis, I should say. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Kavi, for future reference, if I just say Resident Evil and just leave it blank like that, I'm talking about Nemesis. No, do not do that. (laughs) Scratch that from the record. Let the record show that I want Galen to speak correctly if he's going to be referencing a game. There's like a 90 of these freaking games. You say the right one, you come correct. All right. You know what? Sustained. So anyway. Bitch, I'm (laughs) sustaining it. You don't do nothing. You do what I say. You Rosie, you can't. You can't cut, bring up the objection so anyway, and also sustain how it. Is <laughs> you are not the judge, jury, and executioner. Mechanic. <laughs> uh, yeah, just just like this podcast right here, uh, the dodging is finicky, and I'm still getting used to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seventy-five uh, minutes into your playthrough, and you're still getting used to it. Is that what's what's going on here? Actually, yeah. Like, I cannot for the life of me get the timing down on this, and it's really starting to frustrate me. Like, Mm. because the zombies go and they lunge at you, or Nemesis comes up behind you and tries to attack you, and my first instinct is, okay, I'm registering that this movement is happening, I'm going to time it at the last second, because every other game that I've played, that's how dodging happens. And it also being a Resident Evil game, I'm trying to keep that in mind. Like, I'm going down this alleyway, there's a zombie that is there that wasn't there before, or that I dispatched beforehand, and he's just in my way now. Well, I want to try to conserve ammo, so I'm going to juke around him. Well, the dodging mechanic is frustrating, and I keep getting bit, and I don't want to get bit. <laughs> Right. So I have not, I mean, I played the demo, so I I didn't get a good enough feel of the dodging mechanics there. But 
are you always doing it too late or what what are you finding so far i I feel like i'm doing it too late like my my instinct is i want to wait for him to do his lunging attack or he'll like lunge at me and then i'll dodge around him well by the time he's doing his actual lunge at me it's already too late which i feel is weird like i need to start to dodge before he does it he's a big fast boy even the basic zombies you're bad Although, at video games. <laughs> Nemesis is a whole nother thing, and I'll get to him in a minute. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, mechanics aside, I'm also a little taken aback by how they have changed the pacing of this game. Um, they definitely have changed a lot of the story elements. Um, I will really? try to... Yeah, I'll try... It, it's little things, too, and I'll try to remain as spoiler-free as possible, but you find this out in the first, like, 20 minutes of the game. Uh, they change how Brad Vickers dies. Oh, oh, that's that's fine, I think, because... Well, honestly, I could have gone either way, because his death in the third one is so iconic and honestly mm-hmm. really well done. I, I, right? I love that death scene so much, and I even just went back and watched it a couple of weeks ago, maybe, and it still holds up, and it's still awful. Exactly, and it shows you so much information in that. It shows you... Who is this thing who's, you know, hunting you down? Yeah. What it what makes him special versus something else? Like it it really is the premier introduction of Nemesis. Yes, that's the first time you really see him. Except for the title screen. <laughs> also, the first time, if I remember correctly, that that happens is when you as Jill go to the um police department. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's not what happens. Okay, that's fine. Don't tell me what it is though, because I I haven't played it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just little changes like that. Um, it actually takes you a little while to get to the police department. And hmm. when you do, it's under different circumstances than what the original game was. Okay. Um, do you remember there was a puzzle in the subway station where there were little gems that you could get? Yes. Okay. Uh... In the remake demo, I saw the panel there, and mm-hmm. it was in the subway station. In the original Nemesis, that was on your way to City Hall, outside above ground. Yeah. So that that pu- that is a puzzle. Um, there isn't anything detailed. It's literally just you hunt around, you find the pieces that you need, and you plug them in. Yeah. Um, and That's what it, it was in the original, too. Yeah. It's also purely um, optional. Like, nothing story-related links you into that or oh, cool. I like prompts that. you to do that. So um, I definitely recommend it because the stuff that you get is very good. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, that's cool though, because I don't ever want like, especially a remake or reimagining. I never want it to be a complete retread. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were some things that I did uh, discover that I appreciate them leaving in. Uh, one of the things is with your confrontations with the nemesis. You can kill him, actually. When he, he when he does pop up and he's chasing you around, you can down him and he does drop stuff. Yay! So so that allusion to the old way. It's not necessarily like handgun part A and B, you combine it to a new gun. It's more of what you did in Resident Evil 2, where you could get additions and add them onto your gun to make it better. Cool, cool. Yeah. I like that. Because that was something that was even in the original RE2 when you mm-hmm. encountered Mr. X, but they left that out of the remake of 2, and I always felt like that was um, a misstep, because when Mr. X does show up, you can down him, but he doesn't drop anything. And, you know, the only thing that you really gain from downing him is you get to run away, but you can also just run away and mm-hmm. not waste your bullets, because... He didn't really have a whole lot going on with him. You know, he'd walk towards you, he'd hit you, and that was it. Exactly. And of course, Nemesis is like flipping, flopping all the way around. He's using his tentacle. He's like Spider-Man. But here's the thing. Nemesis is weird. Like, he's much more scripted than beforehand. Um, the time You can definitely anticipate the times that he does come up. Uh, from what I've seen, there's no randomness to his appearance. Or okay. his appearances. Um... And also the times that he's chasing you around that, like, so in Resident Evil 2, when Mr. X was chasing you around and you had to try to solve puzzles while he was coming after you, I haven't come across any situations where that's been a thing. Okay. It's always been, 
Nemesis is here, GTFO. Okay, that's um, that's pretty like the original RE3, where he would show up at scripted times, and then if you mm -hmm. run away from him, then he is going to follow you, but only so far. Yeah, I, I haven't found any situations where I'm choosing to run away from him, and that choice carries over with the, the decisions of the rest of the game. Okay. So yeah, I mean, overall, it's it just feels like a very different experience. And Capcom, I found, is really, really good about doing these remakes. They they have this fantastic tendency of being able to keep to the original spirit of the game and focus on those nostalgic elements of what you felt when you played the game as opposed to relying so heavily on uh, self-references and easter eggs and things like that like they're there but they're not the main focus of everything uh -huh. yeah yeah also carlos uh, carlos is amazing in this <laughs> i know he's so hot right <laughs> actually yeah like i, I will agree to that <laughs> How how is the banter between Jill and Carlos? In the demo I was like, oh, pretty good. I, I think I like this. Yeah, and and Carlos kind of keeps that you know, not cheerful optimism because it's more grim, more tempered than that. Uh -huh. It's a tempered optimism. Okay. And he kind of keeps that throughout the entire thing. And there's a couple of times where he actually pops up and he saves you. Like uh -huh. Um, in the bit where he is introduced, or Nemesis introduces his array of weaponry, and he's aiming a rocket launcher at you, um, it actually turns out that Carlos comes in and he's like, hey, Jill, get the fuck over here, and then he's packing his own heat. Mm. Boy, your, your selection of words, Galen, you still haven't gotten that I, microphone. I, I selected that on purpose. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm sure you you never have done anything on purpose. <laughs> um, your wife will confirm. I <laughs> probably. Uh, I really appreciate the banter and the camaraderie that goes beyond it. Like it, it starts with the whole. There's still that Carlos bravado from the first game of, hey, I don't want to leave you in a you know Carlosless world. It's like okay, <laughs> I see what you're doing there. But there's also a, like a, a genuine um, appreciation and honesty uh, mm. for it later on. He's, there's a point where he's just like, hey, you freaking saved us all. You're awesome. You're, you know, a lot more, a lot braver than I was. And I was like, hey, that, that's kind of a cool moment. It's not all about. Carlos you know, said that to Jill? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Jill also kind of like comments back on it as well. It, it's a good, I love the relationship that they have between those two characters. Awesome. So. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Jill is probably my favorite Resident Evil character, so I'm really excited to just have her back in the series and have her done well. I know, you were so excited when she showed up in 5. Jill Valentine was not in Resident Evil 5, Galen. That was Nina Williams <laughs> from Tekken. <laughs> I will say I feel like this is a little short, so... Yeah, that seems to be everybody's complaint with it. Yeah. Uh, I think playing through it, I'm about... I put in about four to five hours in personally, and I'm at the hospital section as Carlos. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I, I feel like I'm halfway through the game, if not more. Like, I Yeah, that's a little that more... Feeling. At least compared to the, the old one, that's a little more than half. Yeah. So... Um, I'm going to be playing a little bit more, and then maybe I'll break into Resistance. I'm not too, like, chomping at the bit to get that one set up, but, yeah. uh... Because I hear that game has her transactions, and that's already a turnoff for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. And I've heard, like, some pretty mixed things. I'm hearing that, like, the base of it is actually fun. It's not mm -hmm. well done, but it's fun. And I'm fine with that, like... I like PS2 jank. You know, it's my great aesthetic. <laughs> so if that's what this game has got, then, you know, I'll try it a little bit. But I don't know. I Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. I look forward to hearing more about this game from you. Absolutely. I'm, I want to play it so bad, but I'm trying to, like, hold off on it. I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, let's, let's find a Saturday night or something to 
hang out online and I'll do the whole PS4 streaming thing. I Saturday I, nights I are will, my busy nights. I will let you play the entire game and I will just sit there and watch. It'll be like we're hanging out all over again. <laughs> Galen, are you not trying to entice me to play this game or are you trying to push me further away from it? I'm just saying, if you want to play it for free, there's a cost. <laughs> the cost <laughs> is this guy. <laughs> where, where do your loyalties lie? <laughs> With Jill Valentine. Oni, that has been my trip through a desolate wasteland with, you know, monsters and demons and everything like that. Uh, demons? Demons are in Darksiders, right? <laughs> they are, but they're not in Resident Evil, the game that you've been playing. Uh, they are in the game that eventually became Onimushu. Oh god, you just, everything is wrong. <laughs> so what Galen was trying to force here is called a segue. I have been playing Darksiders War Mastered Edition. Mm-hmm. This is an interesting one. Darksiders is a long-running series. It's actually 10 years old at least. Yes. And it has expanded from video games to, like, comics and stuff. There's, like, a board game as well. <laughs> a board game that came out with the special edition. <laughs> yeah, of the fourth game. Yeah, it's like a... $250 special edition or something like that. That's we, the we, trend we talk, nowadays. Yeah, we talked about it once. Yeah. So, anyway, this is the first game in the entire series, not chronologically, but just, like, in real-world terms. This is a remaster of a 2010 game. Yeah. And I say that because it feels very 2010. Ooh, ouch. Ouch. Not like visually or anything. Like visually, it's you know like definitely dated, but uh... there were there was still a thing about. I don't want to call it a triple A title because I don't think this fell into that category. But uh, I there, think it did. I think it did. There there was definitely something about games at that beginning of that decade that it's like they knew what they wanted to do, but they started to cookie cutter themselves, uh... and they they never fixed the problems that they had in that you know, that time frame, so. Yes, that is a that is an accurate description of some of those games. Not this one, though. Um, when I say it feels very 2010, I mean, like, in the late aughts and the early 10s, there was a lot of very, uh, like, badassery and self-serious stuff and mm. lots of browns and grays happening visually. It's the end of the world and humanity is dead and I am the destroyer. Sure. And that's what <laughs> sort of is happening with this game. Mm -hmm. So in Darksiders, you play as War. He's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Mm. And it is very much a like hack and slash God of War style gameplay with a little bit of Zelda in it. I, the first game that I ever played in the series was the second game on the Wii U. And I really enjoyed that one. That one was very, had a, a great tone to it. Great writing, voice acting. Um, it was very open, like a Zelda game is, where, you know, there's dungeon stuff that you go to, but, like, big open areas, kind of like Twilight Princess, but it actually had some things in it. And, mm -hmm. you know, you had your horse from the very beginning, and so you ran around everywhere. And I had a great time with that. Really did. So I was looking forward to playing this first one. And I'm a really big fan of the, like, story setting of the Darksiders series and the aesthetic especially mm -hmm. uh, i interviewed the director of this game joe medrera he i had interviewed him like last year at e3 he is such a passionate person and has like such strong artistic visions for this series he is like a writer and a artist as well he works for airship syndicate now which i think is his business that he started up it, it's a whole story anyway we'll not go into that yeah now not to interrupt uh Speaking of the the aesthetics of it, the character designs, if I'm remembering correctly, are very Gears of War esque muscles on muscles on muscles, right? Like the characters are like huge, you know, mountains of meat. <laughs> these these word choices, um, I kind of. I I wouldn't. Uh, they are definitely an exaggerated design, but I wouldn't say like super super crazy. Mm-hmm. 
it it helps the game stand out and you know war does have like a lot of armor and he also has a lot of upper body strength very stocky just like chunky designs um but it's inspired by christian mythology because there's you know the four horsemen thing that's from christian mythology so yeah. it uh it mixes like those elements in with fantastical elements as well um that's something i'm gonna get into though in a second i'll i'll talk about what i like so far so there's a lot of impressive set pieces the opening part of the game has like a colossus sized enemy like shadow of the colossus style i feel like that was also very like early early aughts yeah yeah there's you know bits and pieces of like zelda style gameplay in it that i'm enjoying um and of course like i said the setting of the four horsemen and the uh they're basically the peacekeepers between like heaven hell and earth sort of or like you know, the reality realm or whatever mm -hmm. and of course the voice acting in this game is fantastic uh, the voice acting in the second game was so good, so I'm sure that this one's going to get even better. I knew that Mark Hamill uh, played a role in one of these. Was that the first one or the second one? Definitely the first one. He okay. is the Watcher whom you get assigned. So you get... There's some weird story with like this council that oversees everything, and they're, you lose your powers, and they force you to do their bidding kind of thing. And they bind you to the watcher which is one of their people and that's who mark hamill voices so he he's kind of like your navi <laughs> now i'm just imagining the joker going hey listen no it's star wars man uh luke skywalker saying hey listen i hate what you've done to my character <laughs> But anyway, um, overall, I'm, I don't know, I'm kind of underwhelmed by it. Uh, visually, kind of as I was saying before, it's pretty drab by today's standards. Grays yeah. and browns and stuff. Games in the late aughts and early tens were rife with that. So I'm glad that we're kind of out of that. Even, you know, the games that are really guilty of that, like the Call of Duty series or whatever, they even have like color in their games now by their standards. Yeah. 2010, the year of brown EG. EG. Like Luigi, Brown EG. I don't know. What the fuck <laughs> was that, Galen? <laughs> Every time I'm like, you said the worst thing I just heard right now. That was the worst thing you've ever said on this podcast. <laughs> anyway. I'm keeping a tally for every time you say that. Two more and I get a free Sunday. It's a punch card. That's not ice cream. Anyway, <laughs> the also things that I'm kind of so-so on, the story and the physical setting of the game. The physical setting is in, like, present day on Earth. And I was like, what? Because I played the second game and that was, you know, not that at all. So when it started, mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, weird. Um, the story is also kind of, like, so-so. I don't know. I, th that's, like, a minor complaint. But mm. the, the character of War is very boring and very self-serious and i like edgy nonsense very much like a devil may cry game where it's it's just gone so edgy that it's like a joke of itself and you know there's it's super edgelord territory yeah yeah this one is not going far enough it's right in the in the realm of like we're serious and we're gonna take ourselves seriously and you know we're making this badass metal game and mm -hmm. it's just not landing with me at all and, which is weird because I really enjoyed the writing in the second game. Yeah. As I said, War is like a very self-serious character. He's a great foil for his brother Strife, who is like kind of sadistic and playful. And he, those two star in the fourth game in the series, which is actually a prequel to this one. And so I'm looking forward to playing that game. Huh. Okay. <laughs> That's Darksiders Genesis. There's a lot more games in this series than I actually remember there being. Mm, like you said, just hey, four this main is ones. <laughs> well, and you said this is the fourth in the series, and I was like, there's a fourth one? Yeah, yeah. It was like a soft four because I think the third one that came out was sort of a board mixed. Game. No, no, no. It was mixed critically and. I think it didn't sell well as well, so they had a plan to do a fourth one, but I think they pared back a lot of their stuff because the fourth one is very different 
in gameplay style. It's almost like a side story. Like, story-wise, it's actually a fourth game proper. Gameplay-wise, it's very different, and I think it's shorter, and it wasn't even a full release game as well. If I remember correctly, isn't Genesis a, like, a dungeon crawler-esque thing? There's one in the series that it's like a dungeon crawler. It is that one that you're thinking of. It looks okay. like it, but it doesn't play, or and it's not designed like that, but it looks like it. It's kind of like Travis Strikes Again or No More Here Heroes. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I haven't played it yet, but it just basically okay. from what, you know, Joe Madrera was saying when I interviewed him and from other people from the show floor back then. But getting back to this one, um, the other thing that is really holding me back on this game is the combat. It's very basic to start off. Um, there's one combo that you do and just one. And you can buy items and new skills and stuff, and I know Did, that it expands. Can, can you can you grind around to actually like get more skills and to, like is there a leveling system to this? Grind around, well, like grind out your battles, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yes, you can grind up and down your enemies all over. Oh, so it's that kind of game. I wish. <laughs> Yes, so you get like currency, which is like experience points, and then you buy your stuff and you get more stuff. But okay, so it does expand, but it's just like at the very beginning, they give you way too few things. Like I'm already bored with the combat. Okay, well, and I I asked that originally because I can see how a very minute combo system and it trying to be an action game, but also expanding that out to RPG esque mechanics where you're trying to you know, grind and get your levels up and everything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, mean, I, I can there's... see how that can wear thin really fast. Absolutely. It's that kind of game, which at that time, you know, we're maybe still slightly fresh. Uh, nowadays, it's like we've seen a million of these kinds of games, so it, I don't mm -hmm. think it holds up very well. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to keep playing it. I, I really want to give it a fair shake. I want to play it again a little bit more, but it's hard to, like, force myself to go back and play a game, especially when I'm, like... I don't have a whole lot of time on my hands, you know? Why do I want to spend it playing a game that I'm not sure about? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I'll try and give it another go. You could be playing Game of the Year of 1997 Final Fantasy Remake. Actually, I can't because my game will not get here until the 24th of this month. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> I never pre-order games. I pre-ordered this one because they were doing a sale, so I got it actually a little bit cheaper. And oh, nice. Yeah. So, cool. But... I mean, of course, this was way before coronavirus happened, so, like, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have pre-ordered in this current situation because it's kind of not responsible to order a bunch of stuff online that you don't need to just because they're busy doing whatever. And mm -hmm. so now I have this pre-order game, and it's not going to get here for another two weeks. And it's like, ugh, I should just buy the digital version. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, I'm all screwed up with that. But anyway... And then by the time it gets here, like, tri Trials of Mana is going to be out. Then right around the corner is Xenoblade. Like, ugh, I'm having the worst time. I know. Big time life problems. Also, that was sarcasm. So you can, can stop writing your comments you. right now, everybody. I can never tell with you. Don't, don't listen to our show anymore. <laughs> sarcasm. That one was sarcasm. No, no. <laughs> So this week, got so much stuff happening with Cooking Mama. Right? <laughs> Who would have seen this one coming? <laughs> cooking Mama baked a souffle, it did not rise, and it was flat. Mm -hmm. Just like Galen's jokes. <laughs> cooking with Mama. <laughs> yes, Cooking with Martha Stewart Mama. What's, what, what has happened this week? Let's break it down. So, okay. the timeline, Galen, of what has happened is... Cooking Mama Cookstar. Yes. Also, one suggestion, we should set up the parties involved before we lay out the timeline, because I feel like that's an important bit. Okay. <laughs> Cooking Mama Cookstar, developed by First Playable Productions, was that right? And then published by Planet Entertainment. Yes. This game came out with very little fanfare, very little marketing happening. At, uh, I think it was technically it came out in March, the very last day in March. And this has just been sort of evolving because it's been, like, gone under the radar. And then little bits of drama came out 
So it released, suddenly was removed from the eShop. And not only that, physical copies have been being pulled from stores as well. So they're doing a straight up yes like, and recall here. they were already not even physically super available just like a regular release game either it was very sparse so people were like what is going on and then the actual game itself when playing it apparently it was running very very hot on the eShop or the eShop the switch mm. and then when people turned it into airplane mode it apparently made the heating problem fine so they're like okay it's something internet related and then people were like, okay, we need to figure out what's going on with this game. Like, there's too many weird things happening right now. So people are kind of connecting the dots and filling in the gaps for themselves. So going back a couple of months ago, Planet Entertainment, the publisher, said something in a sort of a PR statement that Cooking Mama Cookstar was going to be the first game to integrate blockchain technology on major mm -hmm. consoles. And blockchain technology, a very, very simple explanation of it is that it involves cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. So then people were like, oh, there's blockchain technology in this game. Does that mean that it's like discreetly mining cryptocurrency on your switch? And people were like, what's what's happening? What's happening? And so that came out. Those rumors. Uh huh. This is the, the course of events with Cooking Mama Cookstar. Mm hmm. That was then refuted by the developer's first playable productions, and it was denied. So it's apparently false. So a staff member from first playable told Screen Rant that apparently the publisher Planet Entertainment is currently going through a legal battle with the IP holder of Cooking Mama called Office Create. Yes. <laughs> S stay with me, folks. There will be a test at the end of the podcast. There will not be. It's just that it's a roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> so the IP holder, Office Create, wanted the game polished up before release. They were like, it's not in a good state. Got to mm -hmm. delay it. Got to figure something out. Mm -hmm. And Planet Entertainment denied their wishes and released the game anyway in this kind of poor state. And so that's why the two of them are in a legal battle. That's why the game got removed from the eShop because the IP holder invoked their IP rights. Mm. That's what really happened there. The mention many months ago of blockchain stuff was apparently marketing buzzword nonsense that some bigwig at Planet Entertainment knows nothing about. And yes. they were just like trying to be like, oh, we've got teraflops and cookamama flops. That's basically what they were doing. According to this one staffer at playable productions and, and honestly that is so believable to me <laughs> no that is 100 percent believable because if you try to think about making a switch a cryptocurrency mining device it makes no sense whatsoever especially for the steps that are involved in actually making uh, crypto mining a thing and it, yeah. that really adds up to me because god have i seen so many big wigs be like uh, over promise under deliver you know what I mean they're gonna mm -hmm. promise and then whatever the the shit rolls downhill as they say and the little guys are gonna handle it well and from an investor standpoint especially if you're speaking to investors who have absolutely no idea what they're getting themselves into if I come to you and say hey I know you're giving me money to make my thing I'm making a product that not only will sell and make money but when the game's running It'll make even more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they hold up that meme of like Miyamoto holding the DS and it'd be like, it prints money and it's just shooting out from the bottom of it. Right, right. Like, like that's basically their argument for making this a thing. So then after all of that, Planet Entertainment went on Twitter to very vaguely suggest that the game is pulled from the eShop and delayed because of coronavirus related stuff. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird. We're just kind of getting drastically different reports yeah. from everyone on what's going on here. So we're just trying to make sense of it. It's just mm. wild and weird that it involves it really cooking mama. Right? <laughs> the Cooking okay. mama taught me how to make popcorn and now I'm eating my popcorn and watching this shit. The, the exact quote is, as for the crashes and overheating, that would be because... Uh, that is be 
That would be because the game is made in Unity by many people working on their first game. It is not the best product, but it made it through several vigorous reviews by Nintendo and Sony. Um, I do believe the whole legal battle thing about um, Planet Entertainment just publishing the game with the IP holder going, hey, what are you doing? This this isn't the up to the quality that we want this game to be at. Which I completely understand, because if you're an IP holder but not a publisher, your entire represent, er, <laughs> representation and reputation hinges on the final product that this outsource, outside source is doing. Right. If that outside source is going against your wishes with your thing, then yeah, that sends up some major red flags. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just a wild situation involving everybody and... I mean, if there's more developments, we might talk about it just because this is just a fun little shit show. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there there's always stuff like the thing we were talking about on Twitter with Randy Pitchford, one of our, our lovely listeners, Tom. He sent it over to us on Twitter. By the way, follow us and talk to us on Twitter. I love talking and interacting with you guys there. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Randy Pitchford is a, a human garbage dumpster, and... He always has, you know, those shit shows. Uh, but this is also a shit show contender for our biggest embarrassment award that we're going to have at the end of the year. Put it on the list. <laughs> I mean, depending on what space this lands on that list is really going to depend on how this all, like, ends up. So we'll have to keep an eye on this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and moving on, Animal Crossing New Horizons and related physical merchandise. Yeah, they have the imports of them have been reportedly banned in mainland China. Mm -hmm. So this is coming as a report from Bloomberg. The reason for this is because and Galen, you can speak to this better than I can. There is a pattern editor in Animal Crossing New Horizons. Yes. Where you can make your own clothes and your own designs on certain things out of basically dot by dot pixels. Yeah, basically. So some players in Hong Kong have been making protest signs that say things like, you know, free Hong Kong, that kind of stuff. We had this talk, you know, several months ago. Um, yeah. Back in January, was it? God, this year? So many things have happened this year, you know? Was that this year or was that last year? I'm pretty sure it was this year. Just so many things have happened this year. Do you remember when Australia was on fire? Is it still on that fire? Was this year. We have no idea because coronavirus keeps us all indoors. It just... You know what's so funny is every year everybody's like, Oh, so glad 2019 is behind us. So glad 2016 is behind us. 2017 is my year. Every year is worse. Like... <laughs> do the aliens invade next year? Is that what happens? I'm anticipating like Bruce Willis levels of asteroids heading towards Earth next year. What are you talking about with Woos Brillis? Asteroids? The movie, the movie Armageddon. Woos Brillis was in Amma Garden? <laughs> <laughs> what was that sentence that you just said? Uh, Would you like to try again? No. No. So anyway, Animal Crossing in China. Uh, we know that the Nintendo Switch did officially launch in China, and there are some games that have officially launched in China. Stop looking at me like that. Swan. Galen. <laughs> I can't look at you with that face. <laughs> anyway, so there are some games that have officially launched in mainland China, but many games that haven't launched there already have Chinese language support. Mm -hmm. So lots of people will import those games, and plus lots of people speak a different language. So Galen, can you tell me a little bit more about like the pattern editor and how that works in-game? Yeah, uh, it's it's very easy actually. So you have a, I don't know the exact dimensions off the top of my head, but you basically get a can or a paint canvas that you can use pixel art to design however you want to. Um, there is a, an interesting like soft color blending that happens. So you can kind of take that into consideration when you're actually making everything to make it that true pixel art or to give it more of like a curved or blurred line. Anyway, uh, this design, once you make them, you can put them on a number of different items. You can put them on your clothes, you can put them on hats, you can 
put them on, I think, at the back of your cell phone in I the game. I think this sounds like Dr. Seuss right now. <laughs> a little bit. Um, but you can also, once you get to the later stages of the game, you can get a pattern that you can actually put directly onto the ground. Okay. Um, and I have seen people who have taken advantage of this to write things on their island, especially for when they have people who are coming over. Mm -hmm. And, like, when they fly over, it goes over your main residence center. And if your character's standing out there, they can just kind of stand there and wave. But you can also leave messages in the ground for the people who are flying over. That's like, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Welcome to this town, or sup, bitch. Or sup. <laughs> I've seen that one. <laughs> of course. But depending on your the level of skill with your pixel art, like you can put up, you know, pictures or posters. Right. You can make multiple things of designs to make a much larger detailed image. I've seen so many cool, cool things being shared on Twitter of like here's mm -hmm. all the final fantasy characters or oh yeah you know what i mean it's super really creative stuff and i love that animal crossing brings that out in people and it's honestly oh, a brilliant uh gameplay mechanic because it gets people sharing on social media and then you know that's marketing for your game already mm -hmm. it, it really kind of opens up the whole social element and just breathing that creativity into making this island your own yeah the problem the problem that i'm seeing though is that in order to really bring that creativity or to send that creativity out to people, you have to you have to invite people onto the island, which means either A, they have to be on your Switch friend list, or B, you have to send out a Dodo code, which is a temporary code. It only lasts as long as you're logged in and actively playing the game. Like, if you turn it on, set the game aside, as soon as your Switch goes to sleep, well, you're kind of... You know, you've just kicked everybody off of your island. You have to generate a brand new code. Oh. So it's a very directed thing that needs to happen with it. Gotcha. So people are, are utilizing this gameplay mechanic to, you know, say pro Hong Kong liberation uh, messages. And of yeah. course, mainland China, the government is a communist government that controls all the media. And so they are able to just straight up ban these kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. The mainland Chinese government is very oppressive of Hong Kong and continues to be even more oppressive of them o over the years since um, the rule of Hong Kong has been given back to mainland China from British rule. And Hong Kong people are terrified of you know what's happening. So it's, yeah. it's a super serious issue and it shows because mainland china silences them at any chance that they get so that's why they do you know peaceful protests like this um it's, it's just pretty crazy i think that if we do see animal crossing officially released in chinese territories they're gonna require nintendo to remove that feature and that's a huge feature of the game right to like yeah design no, your stuff that that is a an integral part of what makes that game so great being able to create something that's so unique to your own personal style yeah. i mean look at the um i know you've seen this it was the japanese ad for animal crossing before they came out where it was the number of schoolgirls who were wanting to cheer on one of their uh, classmates yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that that would not be possible if you were to remove that feature. Yeah, it's a really big part of the game and I think a really big like draw of why I would want to get Animal Crossing. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just cuz it's all about pers personalization, right? So, it would be a real shame if Animal Crossing even ever gets released in mainland China if that was cut out. I I'm, I'll bet that it probably will never see a genuine release in Chinese territories now because yeah. once something is you know got the red mark on it Chinese government typically doesn't let it in so you know Winnie the Pooh um, that's why people were doing that thing with Overwatch do you remember like when the thing with Blitzchung happened mm -hmm. uh, I think it was January of this year or anyway people were trying were... to uh, associate the character of May with the Hong Kong protests because they know that what the Chinese government will do is ban the visual of that character or whatever, which means that 
Overwatch the game would get banned in mainland China. And that would be huge, yeah. Hurting Blizzard's pocketbook, sort of forcing their hand to be like, listen, you choose money or human rights right now, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I'm sure nothing like that is going to come to a head with Animal Crossing. Nintendo is typically pretty quiet and, you know, path of least resistance on this kind of stuff. To a fault, because I mean, this is yeah, Animal be to Crossing. A fault for sure. Yeah, Animal Crossing is one of Nintendo's biggest IPs. Like, I would put this pretty high up there. Uh, even higher than games like Splatoon or something. Uh, I wouldn't say... Mm, I, don't, I don't know, but sales-wise, in Japan, at least, like, it is nuts. It is already yeah. outsold three plus years of... Or three years of Mario Kart 8 in just, like, yeah. what is it, two weeks now, three weeks now? It's crazy, well, and it's gonna outsell Pokemon, <laughs> uh, whatever the new ones were called. People are crazy about their Animal Crossing yeah, for yeah. good reason. Right. I mean, it, this is a huge investment that Nintendo is making, and like to have to try to make that compromise of do they do they remove this feature? I know they really want to get into China. That was a huge article and a huge push that they've had in their investor meetings. So if this is a compromise that they are making, how is that going to affect their games going forward? Well, okay, well, first off, we have to dial it back for a second and be like, this is all hypothetical. Like, Nintendo has not talked about releasing this game in Chinese yeah. territories or anything like that. So, you know, we're just speculating anything right here. So there's that. No, absolutely. Nintendo hasn't yes. said or done anything or whatever. So I'm hoping that, you know, the Chinese government just doesn't allow it. In, in China, and then Nintendo has to be like, well, we'll cut that as our losses, we'll move on to our next game. Because, yeah. you know, th there's a couple of bad ways that this can go. Like, that's already still bad because, you know, it, it makes the um, people in China suffer that they can't play this game. And, but th the person, the, well, the fault that this lies on is the Chinese government. So it's not like, you know, oh, Nintendo's doing a bad thing or the people are doing yeah. a bad thing or whatever. That's not it. It's the government's fault uh, over there for oppressing their people and the other people of like Hong no, Kong absolutely. and Taiwan. But, but it does also have a lot of rippling effects on how Nintendo as a company will market their games going forward. Like, Absolutely. yeah, okay, if, if Animal Crossing doesn't cut it, yes, they'll have to cut that or take that as a loss. But how many times do they want to do that with this push of trying to incorporate themselves in the Chinese market? Like, right. This, That's this is... exactly it. I feel like this has a lot more weight to it than, like, I'm just kind of realizing right now, like, this has a lot of weight to it, depending on what Yeah, it's here. foreshadowing for sure. Like, honestly, media, all successful media that is um, made outside of mainland China, trying to go into mainland China for the, you know, profits that lie there with the huge uh, explosion of the middle class mm -hmm. in mainland China, um, that's why, like, films, like, Western-made films and Hollywood-made films, they will get re-edited or changed entirely to play in the Chinese market. You know, can't play ghost Ghostbusters over there because ghosts are not allowed according to the Chinese uh, government. You know what I mean? Like, this is the problem that a communist government is mm -hmm. and how it can affect outside media because companies care about making money, right? They're not going to care about... Um, human rights. They're not going to care about all these other things. That's just like mm -hmm. what Blizzard Activision did with Blitzchung when they were, you know, uh, suspended him and everything like that. Like, that's why it is really important for, you know, people like us to talk about why this is an issue and why we need to call out companies when they are choosing money over human rights because that's a, that's a human problem that we globally feel. No, absolutely. Sorry. I'll be damned. <laughs> If they take out that scene where Tom Nook says that he went on a date with a man and it was good, <laughs> they take that out. Yeah, and I you know that's protest. the other thing too is like we talked about this before about like LGBTQ representation, like in films like Star Wars and uh, Avengers and stuff, where yeah. you know they'll include a little scene that's very easily edited, uh, so that mm -hmm. way you know it, it can be shown still in uh, mainland China by editing that scene out because the government doesn't allow. Uh, films with LGBTQ people in it. Yeah. And th it's just, that's the huge problem here. And like now, you know, Nintendo is also slightly affected by it. So we're going to see 
We're going to see how this plays out. Hopefully, Nintendo doesn't, like, remove features. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be something happening that we don't know of. There's yeah. that already happening, I'm sure, in Nintendo games, because that's already happening in video games and media and a whole bunch of other things. And that right there, by the way, I don't know, I'm not talking to any of our actual listeners because all of you guys are super cool and level-headed. But to those people that are always, like, shouting censorship, censorship, like, this is actual censorship, all right? No, this... It's not about Tifa's character getting a redesign where she has a sports bra underneath her uh, midriff tank top thing, that's not censorship. That's a redesign. Yeah. Being like, okay, this game is banned. Or, okay, this company uh, can't uh, sell their, their products here. Like, that is censoring something, you know? And, and here's the here's the real scary thing, is that this kind of a... The impact of something like this is also going to be so subtle that I would be very surprised if more news outlets from all sources kind of pick up on this thing. Like... This is reporting on something that didn't happen or something that nobody knew about. Like if Nintendo does, like you were saying, if Nintendo does make choices that will affect future games based on what wanting to make themselves marketable over in China or whatnot, well, that's a level of censorship that nobody talks about. Exactly, because it's not public knowledge. And that's exactly. already happening, just like it's already happening in film. You know what I mean? It's happening in video games. So so we're going to always bring it up whenever we see it because we both super care about human rights. We both mm -hmm. super care about the people in Hong Kong being oppressed. And we are just all about equality. So if Nintendo does pull a move that is, you know, kind of controversial in the near future, then, you know, we're going to talk about it. and We're going to call them out just like we'll call it any other company. Absolutely. And I I do kind of, this feels weird to say, I do kind of feel bad for Nintendo for being put into this position. They kind of asked for it themselves by wanting to quote unquote get into bed with China. But... Well, I mean, I, but, I don't think there's I anything mean, wrong with wanting to release products in, in all territories and, you know, for markets that are uh, financially viable. But it's just... No, it's... but when you build yourself up as a, as a company that focuses on quality and also has a family-friendly-esque atmosphere and one of those things that is considered to be family-friendly is openness and honesty and just look at how they've handled their misgivings in the past they've always been very forward and very upfront mm. and you know now they're they're just in a like a no i see them being placed into a no-win situation yeah me i mean so way. many companies are and it's difficult yeah. but the burden of all of that, the fault of all of that, is on the oppressive government. Yeah. That's always what we need to kind of realize, you know, because it's so easy to be like, oh, it's the protesters' fault. Oh, it's Nintendo's fault or whatever. Like, no, guys, one step above that, it is the uh, oppressive government. Yeah. Free speech. It's about video games. <laughs> <laughs> It's a topic, you know, we talk about all the things here on Nintendo Everything Podcast. I'm not just going to be like, I played Zelda and I like it. I like the sword and it goes swoosh. Also, Mario, he jump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just don't, we, we talk about everything, man. I was this guy with a blue helmet and I went pew, pew, pew and shot lemons at people. I love Ice Climber. Yeah, that's a great game. Oh, I'm sorry. You were, you were talking about uh, Metroid. Yeah, I forgot Metroid is the one that wears the blue helmet and uh, he shoots the lemons. Yeah, the one who can't crawl. So on to additional DLC, Muffuzz. Galen, what do you have to recommend? Uh, before I put, put forward my recommendation, I will ask you a question, Oni. Do you know how Bitcoin works? Yes. Would you like to explain how Bitcoin works? Precisely. So... Sometimes in a young boy's life, you... I will do... Uh, I'll stop you right there. Okay. <laughs> so, it being a little bit topical, I'm pulling up an old video. Uh, this is done by Tech Quickies. They are a side channel of one of my previous recommendations of Linus Tech Tips. Uh, this video is called, How Does Bitcoin Work? 
and it's a brief six minute video. It does a really good job as far as explaining what is Bitcoin, what is the idea of cryptocurrency, um, how can you make money off of it, and why do people strive to make money? Um, it's just, it's more informative more than anything else, and since, you know, we were cooking up some ideas about it previously, uh, I felt like it was topical. So, check them out. It is a great informative piece. Great! And for me, I am recommending a part one of a three or four part series. It is called The Burning Times, The History of Witches, Part One. This is by a YouTuber called In Praise of Shadows. They recently got recommended through the algorithms, and this one video of theirs that I still haven't watched just blew up. So like, they still have a lot of views and everything like that, but this one particular video, not this one, has like one and a half million views or something crazy like that. And so I started checking out their channel and they have a lot of really good horror related stuff. And you know, Fun. you know, I'm all into that. Yeah. So this video is specifically about historic portrayals of witches and how that led to uh, portrayals of witches in art, literature, TV, and film. This particular part one is fascinating. It's a whole bunch of stuff I never knew. It's about how Heinrich Kramer's book, Malleus Maleficarum, led to centuries of deaths of women and how we now see them in fiction. Witches, not women. Well, hmm. maybe sometimes women. It's <laughs> super informative, super interesting, uh, long form kind of video. Just check it out. Awesome. And now it is time to get a little spooked from our witchy listeners as they write into us using spellcraft, spellcraft, witchcraft, whatever, by sending us emails. You, you know, they can just go ahead and send an email. They don't have to like write it and give it to an owl or something. No. Tell me, tell me actually. All right. In this next email that you, dear listener, yes, you are writing to us. Tell me how you, as a witch or warlock or witch boy, whatever you are, would cast a spell on us and what you would... This is falling apart. I don't, I... Yeah, I was about to say, is there a spell that makes this go faster? Oh, f*** <laughs> you. <laughs> Just write into us. Nintendo, everything pod at gmail.com. That email one more time is nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com. And you might sound something like this magician. Hey, side note, did you ever see that sci-fi show, The Magicians? Cliff watched it. I yeah. can't watch terrible television shows, but boy can, <laughs> can boy can Cliff. You know what? I think he and I would be able to share that, you know, love a bad TV too. I can't watch it, man. I just feel like I'm <laughs> wasting. I feel like I'm accelerating my death. Yeah. I I judge video games and TV shows, everything. I judge all media consumption based on how miserable I am. End of sentence, I guess. That was it. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> so it, the more miserable you are, does that make the product better or worse? Sometimes. You have to get real miserable, though. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry to disappoint you on this one because this is not a miserable email. This is an email from Juan. We got another Juan from Juan. Oh, I see what you did there. I'm sure Juan has also had that happen to him a bajillion times in his life. I'm very sorry. Juan writes in, I am a fan of Chrono Trigger. Hell yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Yet I honestly detest... Chrono Cross as a whole. I love Chrono Cross music and can appreciate its audiovisual production, but story-wise and character development-wise, it's just terrible for me. Even poorer when considering the fate of the cast from Chrono Trigger in this game and the pseudo-intellectual and pretentious ending. I can't remember when the last time was I hated a main character 
as much as Kid, to the point that I'm wary of ever knowing the true Shala. Its gameplay is good, but nothing earth-shattering or as innovative as Chrono Trigger's. I think Chrono Cross is a decent game, but an awful Chrono Trigger sequel in my opinion. My question is, are you able to appreciate Chrono Cross without feeling that it devalues the experience that you had with Chrono Trigger? If so, how do you rationalize it? I can't help but feel that Chrono Cross is really contrived and pretentious, unlike the funny and truly mem uh, memorable experience of Chrono Trigger that captured Toriyama's art, Sugiyama's story, and Sagaguchi's design. And this pains me because the magnum opus of Yasunori Mitsuda is wasted on Chrono Cross. Juan, thank you so much for that email. You always write very uh, well-written emails. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that we actually have several people who write in that just seem like they take a real good time on their emails. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, God, our audience is like so smart. I, I get a big kick out of the fact that our audience is a lot more eloquent than we are. <laughs> oh yeah, way more intelligent than we are, and why do they listen to us? Don't worry, I'll edit that out. Because it's always entertaining to watch the fools. <laughs> That's what my so, friendship with you is based on. So, let's answer what he's got to say. Hey, I'm a likable guy. <laughs> so, I don't know if I did. <laughs> could you go a little bit higher than that? <laughs> Okay, who cast a spell on Oni to turn him into a parrot? What, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope somebody laughed along with that. That was from Archer. I think we have an end credit song now. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> so, Oni. Again, Juan has a couple of different questions, which kind of all bleed into each other, so... First things first. I'm gonna eat your brains, you... then I'm gonna start <laughs> rocking gold teeth and fangs, cause that's what the mother amounts to do. Uh, that's from our Lord and Savior, Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Galen hurts right now, I see his face. Yes! I love how much editing you're gonna have to do in this. <laughs> yeah. Oni, have you played Chrono Cross? Have you played Chrono Trigger? What are your impressions before we get into the question? Absolutely. I love Chrono Trigger. It's probably my most beloved game. It is definitely top tier of my most beloved games. It might be the one. I yeah. replay that game probably once per year. Yeah, as it is with several people. Yes. And I love the DS version. The sort of like relocalization was great. And the additions there was like some side story stuff that was like not interesting but the extra ending boss was great just love that game so so much chrono cross however i have never beaten it i know okay. all about it because i read up on it because the story is what's most fascinating to me i never really jived with the battle system and the sort of like lack of level up system that always bothered me cuz i like grinding in my rpgs and it was kind of convoluted and there was, you know, like 45 characters or something like that. Yeah. And that always upset me because it's like none of these characters are given much characterization. So I just never could stick with it for a game that, you know, is asking like 50 hours of you. Yeah. How about you? Personally, I have never beat either of these games. Um... Just like most games, right? Yeah, just like most games, because I'm not a real gamer. Right, fake, fake, fake. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually own Chrono Cross, and I remember playing it when I was younger. But even when I was younger, I just couldn't get into it. I can't remember if it was because I rented it at the time and then I bought it later in my life, or what exactly happened there. The storytelling in it is not the best. It's very, what feels like, abstract from the very beginning. You're kind of like, what's going on? And like it feels like not enough structure and you fall out of it very easily i think yeah so with that baseline said let's get to the actual question okay um are you able to appreciate chrono cross without feeling that it devalues the experience you had with chrono trigger so for me absolutely i 
always believe that your negative experience with a sequel, prequel, whatever the hell, does not devalue your original experience with, mm-hmm. you know, your beloved game. Um, specifically speaking for Chrono Cross and Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross is like an alternate timeline multiverse kind of a thing. And okay. it's also like time travel stuff too. So in general, all that stuff is very convoluted and not going to make like exact sense because we only have like theories of time travel and theories of multiverses in the first place. So, you know, you know, uh, I think that you can consider Chrono Cross very much a like what if extension of the Chrono universe um, that was mm-hmm. the direct cause of events from the first game. Yeah. Chrono Trigger, especially, is still just an insular story, and I like to still think that Shala is still connected to Lavos through the dimensions, enduring pain and sorrow. And that just, it's just such a bittersweet ending. Yeah. So, how about you? Well, and it's, it's hard for me to answer in this particular question because, like, I don't really have a whole lot of experience with either of the games on this one. Yeah. I'm going to use my favorite example here, the Battle Network series. So there are definitely some games in the series that are not stellar gems compared to the strong emotional connections that I have with other entries in the series. However, I do still appreciate them, and I appreciate them as an overall stepping stone in my overall collective appreciation for the series as a whole. When I think about Battle Network, I'm like, hey, that was amazing. I really remember 3. It was so great being able to customize everything. And 5 and 6 was amazing. I remember getting the high score, beating one of the bosses in less than a second on 6. We don't talk about 4, but that's okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, And especially when you have a game that is as pop, that has a level of popularity to it, like Chrono Trigger, like Battle Network. If you find other people who share in that enjoyment, you can kind of share in that communal either like or dislike of a game mm. or even revel in the debate that can be sparked if you have differing opinions mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah like because people feel so passionately about it exactly so i don't think it devalues the experience of either one yeah and anybody that kind of does feel that about their experiences i really do encourage you to reevaluate why you think it devalues your original experience you know what i mean and i'm not saying yeah. that juan does this um but like there are some people who will be like oh, i can't believe they're remaking ghostbusters or whatever the hell they're ruining my childhood la, la, la. it's like no mm-hmm. that's your original thing still exists do not worry <laughs> yeah but moving into his email he does talk about like chrono cross and how you know it's got great audiovisual presentation, but the story and the characters for him are terrible. Uh, mm-hmm. For me, yes, sort of. I think that it is a very complicated plot that they put way too much into one game. I like a lot of the ideas that they had, and that's why I can really appreciate Chrono Cross, even if I'm not much of a fan of it, because, like, okay, so in Chrono Cross, for those who don't know, it involves like dimensional travel, body switching, uh, parallel universes, brainwashing. Like, there's lots of cool ideas in there, but they all should not have been put into one game, in my opinion. I think that yeah. the same series of events could have happened in Chrono Cross, but happened in a much simpler method, and it would have served the greater story better because it would have been less convoluted. Like, the convolution in that game leads to the whole thing being, what is that saying, less than the sum of its parts. It's bogged down. And didn't that game also have not only multiple endings, but you had to go through multiple playthroughs in order to get all the characters, or to at least experience all the characters? Uh, yes. So, like, some characters were like, okay, if you recruit this person, then the other person won't come with, and that kind of thing. But all of the characters were so, like, one-dimensional that it was... It didn't matter. Well, and there's like over 45 different characters. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah they're, <laughs> and not all of them are going to be gems. Right. It would be fine for me if it was just like, oh, okay, you know, here are the six people that are definitely like the main ones, or here are the main players for sure. And then the other characters are just kind of so-so and you write them off. But for 
this game, like, there's kind of, like, two main characters and then a couple of characters that are important. Like, oh, the, the Harlequin-looking character, she was important. But, mm -hmm. th like, none of them were super fleshed out. And that was a huge problem for me that I can never, like, reconcile. Yeah. But, the, like, the story, getting back to the story, sorry. I think that the most interesting things about Chrono Cross's plot is how it connects with Chrono Trigger in the multiverse. But I like the heady themes that they explored and that's why I can really appreciate it as a as a game in the Chrono universe. I don't think that this would be as a fellow time traveler <laughs> yes. you can relate. <laughs> Speaking as a time traveler myself I don't think that this game would be so divisive if there were one or two more entries in the Chrono series to expand yeah. on its ideas or to expand on just the greater universe of the game. It's just kind of like we got this and that's what the last thing we've ever gotten. Yeah. Well, and like we mentioned before, like there, there is, there are a lot of people who really enjoy this game. Some would people would say that this is like their number one game of all time. That in it holds a lot of weight and gravity to it. And when you have a sequel that is as lackluster as it is, then but lots of people do love the sequel. It's just that it was so very different from the first game in like every single way. Yeah. And but in in a way that it's still very related to the first game just in a multiverse kind of way and that is what makes it so rough for so many people. Cuz yeah. I think a lot of people do know that there's lots of good things to it. So everybody always says about this game that it's a good game but a bad sequel to Chrono Trigger. And I don't disagree with that. I think it can work. It's just I think that we should have had more entries in the damn series. And hopefully we'll get another one sometime in the future. I will die when that day happens. <laughs> They're going to announce that the same day they do um, Super Mario RPG 2. Yep, those are the two things I'm holding out for. <laughs> then the aliens can come right in and conquer us. That's fine for me. <laughs> that is how I rationalize my appreciation for Chrono Cross and how it does not devalue my experience of Chrono Trigger. And actually, Juan, uh, and anybody that's interested, I super recommend a video that I saw a long time ago. I have to rewatch it, but I I'm sure it's good. This guy is awesome. On YouTube, there is a YouTuber named Satchel Drakes, and he made a video about mm. why Chrono Cross is really great to him. And I remember not agreeing with a lot of the points, but he still talks about it in such a fascinating way and he really makes you think and he makes you kind of appreciate the game even if you don't you know feel the same way which is fine nobody is yeah. you know like when you have like videos and opinion pieces it's not about like always convincing the other person it's more about explaining your point of view and you know maybe somebody else looks at it in a slightly different way but you don't have to convince them so check out yeah. i forgot whatever the video is but just go to satchel drakes on uh youtube and look for his chrono cross video I might actually look that up. You should. That that guy is a great YouTuber I feel, anyway. I feel like I've heard of uh, Satchel Drake before. Definitely. So. He's part of the Normal Boots family. Ah, uh, that's where I've heard of him. Okay. I think he's more of a writer. Um, and then every once in a while, he just comes out with a YouTube video that's like a really great think piece. And it's like really well edited, really well shot. He's very professional. Mm -hmm. But I think that YouTube is very much a side hustle for him, at least nowadays. Getting back to it. Thank you very much, Juan, for writing in. Anytime I get to talk about the Chrono series, I am <laughs> ecstatic. So you, Juan, you have made a very happy Oni. <laughs> yes. And if you also would like to make a happy Oni Dino, then you may write into us using magical words on a keyboard by sending us an email to the address of Nintendo Everything Pod at gmail.com. Those happy Oni emails can go to nintendoeverythingpod at gmail.com. Email female. If you want to, like, send a happy Galen email, that's that's fine, too. Not allowed. That goes straight <laughs> to the... That goes worse to spam than spam. That goes straight to the <laughs> trash. <laughs> so what's coming up? What's coming out on nintendoeverything.com? All kinds of great coverage... 24-7. We don't miss a beat. We also have big, big 
Fire Emblem Three Houses translations that we've been working on. <laughs> and they're finally done. Nico, the other translator, and I worked on different portions of this. Do check it out on NintendoEverything.com. Lots of fascinating stuff about Cindered Shadows and the original Three Houses development. Lots of new stuff that I learned about. <laughs> So you can also stay connected to us on the Nintendo Everything Twitter, that's at Nin Everything, and our YouTube, youtube.com slash Nin Everything. Galen. Tony. Twitter, say. At Mobius087. <laughs> Follow for Animal Crossing pictures. Yes! <laughs> actually... I think Animal Crossing is the game that I have used the Twitter share feature more than any other game in the past. Good. Keep it up. Do more. Yeah, I think I will. Uh, I might even post some things to my Instagram, which you can find with the handle true underscore Mobius. What are your uh, Instagram and Twitter and social media outlets? <laughs> you can come interact with me on my Twitter at Oni underscore Dino. And the Insta Grizza Gam mm -hmm. is only underscore underscore Dino. That's a podcast, Galen. I know. It's uh, <laughs> our 75th one. Our 75th one. You know what you should do to celebrate, Galen? Actually, I think this is my 68th. I don't care. You should leave us a reference, <laughs> Galen's I should leave us. I should go to celebrate the ending of this podcast. Ugh. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you, Galen, and everybody else listening should leave us a review or a rating on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called, because that super helps us get recommended. I think I was supposed to say that earlier in the episode. I think I forgot. I don't know. Please kindly do that and give us a share with maybe a friend who hasn't heard of us before. It helps us grow immensely and it helps us bring great content to you guys and encourage on other uh guests such as mr joe zija last episode if you haven't heard that interview with joe zija yet please do check that out and it helps us grow helps us just bring you bigger and better things i have to be honest i actually really enjoyed listening to your uh interview with him yeah thank you very much you were very professional you did a very good job <laughs> Kind of sad you never asked about butts at all. So, you know, <gasps> know. critique where, where it is, but, you know. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Well done. Well done. <laughs> I Actually, I did get a lot of people, you know, giving me really good feedback on that interview, uh, which I was worried about because I was like, wow, this, you know, got like pretty serious and, you know, NPR-esque and it wasn't like super comedic, like how we usually keep the show very casual and upbeat here. Um, that one was very much a an interview interview, which of course yeah. I've done before, but it's just, you know, with the podcast, I have a bit of a, a different direction that I go with it than, you know, typical interviews. We know the formula of the show. You're here for the professionalism and the structure. I'm here for the jokes. That's why only half of the show works. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we need to trim the fat. Oh. Oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> just because you're the bigger of the two of us. Uh, I'm bigger than everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're like two meters tall. Yeah. Yeah. Galen, what are you going to go do after we finish this podcast? Probably beat Resident Evil 3, because I feel like I'm not too far away. And then sleep. You want stars? I'll give you stars. She says that! She says she the thing! Yes! Oh, well, that was the very, very last thing that she said to Nemesis in the original game. She says that earlier in the I game? Uh, I remember hearing her said it when I defeated the nemesis optionally for the first time. Oh, okay, cool. So it might be more of an Easter egg thing. There's a lot of little Easter eggs in there. Like when you're going through the city, you actually come across, I forget what the guy's name is, but he's the guy who holds up in the trailer at the very beginning of oh, Resident yeah, Evil 3. Oh yeah, what the frick is his name? I, I can't remember. I yeah. think it's like Devin something or other. Yeah, but actually anyway. that sounds pretty good. Yeah, so, so he goes into the trailer, and then if you talk to him, I think it's like three times, on that third time, he says the actual thing, like, line for line, that he does from the original. No! I'm not going anywhere. 
Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I want you to play this game! I, I'm staying in here to keep away from those undead monsters! Mm. Now leave me alone! Yeah. That's what he says. Hey everybody, let's go play some Resident Evil. And then talk about it next week on the podcast. Until then, we will see you next week for everything Nintendo. Stay tuned to Nintendo Stars. <laughs> everything. <laughs> This is why we kick him off. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>